My mom owns the house since 2006, but I'm the one who has the time to do this. Our next door isn't typically filled with petty and unnecessary complaints about other neighbors. It's mostly lost dogs. I'm new to the neighborhood, repair recommendations, and the rare car break-in. So, I asked on the Nextdoor app, what exactly does the HOA do, and why are they collecting money? This neighborhood's HOA has no benefit, except for that empty promise of maintaining neighborhood value that a large amount of people in this country clings to. We used to have a cop car patrolling the neighborhood on certain nights, a playground, events, and street washer trucks, until, like 2015, playground was burned down and never replaced. A whole street once had been forced by the city to pay for the drainage ditch. Streets stay bumpy, and the only groundskeeping being done is replacing the flowers at the two signs with the cheapest flowers from Home Depot. Pre-COVID, we had a meeting with the new management company of the neighborhood that took over from the last, along with the HOA, and they could not answer a thing or offer any alternatives when homeowners voiced concerns. So the fellow neighbors on next door were talking about how much they hate the HOA. And suddenly, a loud, annoying voice named Gwen started attempting to do damage control on every comment in the post. The only thing she told me that they do is bookkeeping. My mom logged on and asked, when's the last time they sent us the financial budget info? And that's when she got silent. Then, in an attempt to scare me or convince me they do work, she DM'd me asking me to help hand out flyers around the neighborhood months from now and asked for my address. To piss her off, I messaged back LOL cute. That made her angry and eventually I got too busy to cause more chaos. But now, I'm about to read every document I can. Even found the management company of our HOA. It seemed to be the only place I could request information according to the city's records and requested as much information as they can legally give me. I currently have 100 tabs of North Carolina. HOA laws from the very resourceful HOPB website. It's time someone finally dissolves this HOA, and I happen to have lots of time on my hands. Wish me luck! This story was shared with me by my dad a couple of years ago, and I later confirmed it with the person it happened to. During the pandemic, thieves were rampant in stealing catalytic converters. One of my dad's friends, who we'll call DF, owned a lifted truck from the 90s, making it easier for thieves to access the catalytic converters underneath. DF had just gone to a local store to buy some beer when he returned to find a random scrawny guy beneath his truck cutting away with an electric saw. Without a second thought, D.F. swiftly delivered a powerful kick to the guy's groin. Being ex-military, he knew how to kick and his steel. Toad boots only added to the impact. The scrawny guy instantly screamed and yelled in Spanish, while D.F. warned him to crawl out from under the truck unless he wanted another kick. Clutching his injured groin and crying, the scrawny guy complied. D.F. captured a photo of him with his phone and threatened to hand it over to the police if he ever dared to approach his truck again. Although the scrawny guy intended to grab his saw and leave, D.F. ordered him to abandon it, hoping he would learn a lesson about stealing from others. Defeated, the scrawny guy limped away and D.F. never encountered him again. As for his exhaust, D.F. had to weld up the cut made by the thief attempting to remove the catalytic converter. However, there was no further damage. Later on, D.F. had someone weld rebar around his catalytic converters, making them harder to steal. Since then, nobody has touched them. On that note, I'll include one more story, but please keep in mind that it's from the rumor mill, so its authenticity is uncertain. Apparently, a guy will call SG caught a couple of individuals trying to steal his catalytic converters while his truck was parked in his driveway in the middle of the night. Instead of confronting them verbally, SG retrieved his pellet gun and shot the lookout guy in the shoulder and even managed to hit the other guy's backside as they fled. That's all I know about that particular incident. However, it serves as a reminder that attempting to rob people around here comes with a price. Many individuals in this area are armed and ready to defend themselves. I worked in maintenance for an organization that owned a large number of aged care facilities. 
Even though they were supposedly not for profit, they went all out to scam the government for as much money as they could, for example. I once saw a claim for wandering behavior in a bedridden resident so they could claim he had dementia, put him in a locked ward, and get extra money. I became aware that they were paying less than the minimum wage for many of non-nursing staff. A high percentage of housekeeping were from overseas. In my country, you can claim back wages for six years, and it so happened. I was just about to reach that mark, and I was thoroughly sick of their hypocrisy. I scheduled a meeting with the care manager and human resources. In the meeting, I requested to be paid the correct wage. After they realized I was not going to back down, they agreed to pay me correctly and would back pay me, but only if I didn't tell the other employees. I declined, and it ended up costing them over $700,000 to back pay everyone. I was recording the conversation and took them to Fair Work, an independent workplace ombudsman. They made everyone, with the same job description as me, redundant because they couldn't think of a way to legally fire me and then outsourced maintenance, which ended up costing them much more. I took a nice holiday with the redundancy pay and reported them with documented proof, to the government age care regulator for the fraud. They were inspected with a fine-tooth comb, and two of their flagship homes were put under six months' constant government supervision. Always remember that wage theft is the largest crime wave in history. It is ongoing, and no one ever goes to jail for it. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to teach at a private urban religious college while pursuing my MS degree. It was a valuable experience for me before I moved on to pursue my PhD. The college usually assigned me to teach accelerated night courses designed for non-traditional learners, which mainly consisted of adults returning to school after a long break. I thoroughly enjoyed teaching these students and had a great time with them. While I encountered a few challenges with some students overall, my experiences were positive. However, there was one couple named Hannah and Larry who proved to be quite problematic. That semester, I was asked to cover a more traditional course at the last minute. Unlike the accelerated courses, this one met three times a week for an hour throughout the entire semester. Additionally, the class was very small, consisting of only four students. Normally, a small class size is manageable and can be great, but in this case, Hannah and Larry posed a challenge. They had a consistent issue with attendance. To put it mildly, they would show up for a class or two and then disappear for a week or more without any prior notice. Just when I thought they were gone for good, they would unexpectedly return, usually with a vague excuse, like medical issues, car problems, or work-related matters. Initially, I tried to be understanding, knowing that life can sometimes throw unexpected curveballs. However, over time... I became increasingly suspicious that they were fabricating stories. Well, I was immediately suspicious, but I usually give people the benefit of the doubt up to a certain point, just as my own professors did for me. Their inconsistent attendance was particularly frustrating because of the small class size. Every time I prepare for a session, assuming all four students would be present, they would skip class and disrupt my plans. Yet, when I anticipated their absence and prepared activities for only two students, they would unexpectedly show up. This constant back and forth made it difficult to maintain a consistent flow in the class. What made matters worse were two additional factors. Firstly, whenever they did show up, both Hannah and Larry carried an entitled attitude, expecting everyone to accommodate them and bend to their will. And secondly, they simply weren't doing any of the assigned work. These two factors eventually reached a tipping point when Hannah, the more assertive and confident of the couple, started demanding extensions and the ability to hand in late assignments. Despite my better judgment, I would grant their requests, only for both Hannah and Larry to neglect the work once again. I usually strive to be accommodating to my students within reason, but it became apparent to me that Hannah believed she could manipulate me and get away with it. That simply couldn't stand. I have my own sense of pride and refuse to be seen as a pushover. Now, I could have immediately shut them down and refused any more extensions. However, I was convinced that Hannah would cause a scene and escalate the issue to the administration. While I knew the administration would support me, dealing with the whole ordeal was something I didn't particularly desire. 
At that time, I was already overwhelmed with my second MS degree and two other jobs. I was incredibly busy and hadn't even planned on teaching that semester. I only agreed because they needed someone. Moreover, being an easygoing person, I have my limits. I was genuinely angry by this point, but I also possessed a somewhat twisted sense of humor. If Hannah wanted to think she had me under her thumb, then so be it. I would provide her with enough rope to hang herself. For the next few weeks, whenever she requested an extension, I would smile and say, Sure. However, deep down, I chuckled, knowing very well that nothing would be submitted. Each time, I would write emails to Hannah and Larry, reminding them of the new deadline. Having written records is crucial, my dear students. Eventually, we reached the final exam. Having not seen the couple in several sessions, I was genuinely surprised when they stumbled into class to take the test. As expected, they failed, but there was nothing I could do about that. To my surprise, Hannah approached me in front of the class and asked for another extension. With my most authoritative teacher voice, I expressed my disappointment. However, I agreed to her request acknowledging that life can be unpredictable. Nevertheless, I made it clear that I would be posting the final grades the following weekend, and the absolute latest I would accept any late submissions would be Friday at 11.59 p.m. As soon as the clock struck midnight, my books would be closed. I asked them both if they understood, and they feigned a semblance of seriousness, as they assured me they did. I sent them an email to confirm everything, ensuring there was a written record. With that done, I sat back and started grading the finals over the course of the week. It wasn't that much work since there were only four exams. Although there was a risk that they would follow through and submit their work, I felt quite confident at this point that it wouldn't happen. Friday night arrived, and since I had finished my other jobs for the day and completed my own schoolwork, I decided to reward myself with a few beers and indulge in some video games to unwind. At a certain point, I glanced at the clock and realized it was midnight. I leisurely opened my email and sent a reminder to everyone that the submission window had closed. If I granted an extension, it had to apply to the entire class. I wasn't playing favorites, not that anyone else needed it. I cracked open another beer, let out a villainous laugh, and continued with my game. Sunday rolled around, and it was time for me to post the final grades for the semester. Normally, I despised failing students, but I must admit I had a smirk on my face as I assigned Hannah and Larry the Fs they had earned. Just ten minutes after saving the grades, I heard the familiar notification sound of my email, followed by another one. Ah, who could it be this time? Of course, it was Hannah and Larry. Larry's email could be summarized as, Oh my God, didn't you receive the email with our work? I sent it on Friday. Hannah's email expressed the same sentiment. It was clear that they were hoping to get another day or two to submit their work using this tactic. After all, hadn't I been so accommodating and gullible throughout the semester? Oh, the fools! They played right into my hands, and this was the moment I had been waiting for. To be certain, I checked my inbox again, just to make sure I hadn't missed any emails from them. I hadn't. With a satisfied grin, I responded to both of them. I'm sorry, but I didn't receive your emails. I even double-checked after your last message. Sometimes emails do get lost. At this point, I imagined Larry smiling as he read my response. He must have thought he had won again. Oh, what an idiotic professor. Continuing my email, I wrote, Here's what I need you to do. Go back to the email you supposedly sent me with the work Take a screenshot that clearly displays the timestamp of the email and forward it to me along with the work you claim to have submitted. This way, it can be proven that you sent it on time. I replied to Hannah's email, reiterating the same instructions. What was their response? Did their eyes widen in realization of the consequences of their actions? Did panic set in? Were there tears, remorseful cries, gnashing of teeth, and pulling of hair Sadly, I'll never know. They never contacted me again. They didn't even attempt another excuse. And me. Well, I decided to buy some more beer that night to celebrate once again. Occasionally, I share this tale with my current students as a humorous reminder that 1. Yes, I am accommodating. 2. Yes, I have a laid-back personality. But 3. 
I am not a fool to be deceived or taken advantage of. It usually earns a good laugh, and if some of those laughs sound a bit nervous, well, that's even better. 